Good evening. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. And what's your question tonight for the panel? Oh, good evening, panel. My question tonight is about uh, Gloucester Coal. Now, um, it hasn't sort of done much a lot in the last almost close to a year. And um, like RBS Morgan just recently just raised its, um, its value to like up to $23. Just so you panel knew much about what was going on with Gloucester Coal. Thank you. This is probably a good one for you to look at, Roger, because sure. it does have a, a history of, of, of earnings in there. Uh, yep. Sorry, Mark, this probably pops up in your model as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounds like he's dropped out. We've dropped out. We'll still go to that because it's, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, he'll be there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, look, the overriding issue for coal companies for me is that there's been a huge amount of enthusiasm, um, you know, uh, optimism unbridled, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, partly because there's been some takeovers, um, partly because China's seen to be. Uh, you know, growing without any without any speed humps, um, but in reality, most of these businesses are trading at very steep premiums to their intrinsic values. Um, so I'd be very very cautious. Uh, China is now uh, now seeming to put the brakes on its fixed asset spending. Um, there's going to be a new five year plan released, I think, in the next month or so. Um, there's an expectation that GDP targets might be lowered. Um, there's a whole bunch of empty cities that have been built, empty buildings bridges that no one walks across, roads that no one drives on. So demand for coal and demand for iron ore might actually drop. And we've seen iron ore prices now drop 11%. Um, if that continues, um, then all the enthusiasm around coal companies could actually uh, reverse and become quite, quite pessimistic. And so you need just to be mindful of that. I haven't bought any coal companies because I've found most of them to be at big premiums. It, it, times have definitely changed, though, from the, when they were producing coal and selling it for twenty dollars US overseas. We're seeing sure. consistently high prices. Traditionally, these prices. Well, hang these on a sec. You've seen well, consistently uh, high well, prices. Consistently, you know, coal prices don't. You know, commodity prices don't go up in a straight line, and they're very rarely stable. That's why they're, they're called commodities. They're commodities because they're cyclical in nature. So just be mindful that you know, this is the yeah. difficulty in valuing these types of businesses. You yes. know. What is the coal price going to be? That's what drives return on equity. Yeah. And I don't, I'm no good at predicting where the coal price is going to go. I don't know about you, Mark. No, no, we'll never clue. No, so, you know, I mean, you know, you lick your finger, stick it in the wind and say, well, the coal price is going to be this and based on it, that's the return on equity. But um, based on present estimates, the price is still higher than my intrinsic value. The thing is, there'll be a time where, you know, the coal, the coal price has dropped 50 or 60 per cent mm. and China's been going slowly and slower than everyone expected for a couple of years uh, and people think it's all over for China and, and there's going to, you know, and the US is re-emerging and China story's all over and the share price will be at a discount to its intrinsic value and that'll be the time to look at it and talk about We've it. We've got Tony. Good evening, Tony. Oh, sorry. Is it Troy? Yeah, Troy from Boston. Uh, panel, how are you? Um, I've just got a quick question just in regards to uh, one of uh, Roger's A1 companies, which is ARB, uh, the uh, mob that do the uh, bull bars and four-wheel drive uh, accessories. Yep. Uh, just in regards to, I suppose, the current status on that. And just, uh, I suppose, a bit more of a general question uh, directed towards Roger in regards to uh, when you're finding a lot of the companies that have uh, seem to have a bit of a mismatch in price uh, compared to intrinsic valuation. It, they seem to be uh, companies that are quite thinly traded. Uh, and does because they're thinly traded, does that sort of uh, lead to there being such a mismatch in price towards value? Yeah, okay. uh, interesting. So ARB, we see this becoming an international brand at the moment. Uh, what are your thoughts yeah, on that well, one? It's, look, it's, um, it, it's rallied from a, you know, from two dollars forty-five back in March two thousand and nine. It's now trading up around seven dollars fifty or thereabouts. Um, and uh, and you can see that on the on the chart there. It's um, uh, it's gone very well. What's interesting is that that most recent rally from about five dollars seventy-five. You know, that's that's really closed the gap between. Um, the price and the intrinsic value for this particular company. Um, so, so Simon, uh, uh, or is it Troy? Troy. Was it Troy? Sorry, Troy. Uh, so, um, let me give you some numbers here. Intrinsic value for ARB seven dollars ninety-five. Um, so it's about uh, forty cents or fifty cents below that at the moment. Eight dollars fifty-two the following year, and eight dollars eighty-three um, the year after. Great business. Obviously, the um, the manufacturing plant in Thailand means that they're going to get higher margins because their labour costs are lower over there. Um, uh, their, their profit recently jumped about 44, 45 percent. So, um, you know, that they're, they're great results. It is a great company. Um, the bigger the discount you can get this company, obviously, the more attractive it is. Now, in answer to your second question, um, yes. Recently, some of the stocks that I've been talking about have been thinly traded, but that's not always the case. 
Um, I've also talked about Woolworths being at a uh, recently being trade, trading at its intrinsic value. Uh, it's since rallied uh, four or five dollars, but you know that one's not thinly traded. So it is true that some are thinly traded, and, and the response to that is that you probably wouldn't weight your portfolio so heavily to those thinly traded stocks because if something goes wrong, you need to be able to get out. Um, and, and that's something that you need to consider. So when I'm investing my own personal portfolio, I, I have a, a weighting that, I, that I describe as my ideal weighting for my portfolio in, in an A1 business that's at a big discount. Um, uh, but then I'll, I'll adjust that weighting based on the liquidity of the stock. So if it's not very liquid, I won't buy as much as perhaps I would if it was a, a Woolworths, for example. It's so I hope that answers the question. Roger, that, that question probably also comes from um, the fact that a lot of those a1 companies in the space that you like are mid caps as well, yes. uh, and so unlike Woolworths, there just isn't the liquidity in the day. It's quite often a, sub right. a substantial shareholders have 30% rather than 10%. Well, th that's true. Um, look, uh, if you buy great businesses and they stay great businesses and they don't get too ahead of themselves in terms of intrinsic value, and that intrinsic value rises, what you're going to find is the value of the business goes up the price of the shares will go up, the market capitalisation will go up, and while there might not have been much liquidity when you first bought the shares, uh, it'll, you know, the, if it's a good business, ultimately it'll end up in the, you know, the ASX 300 or something like that, uh, or maybe even the ASX 200, and then suddenly there's a whole bunch of liquidity because there's a bunch of fund managers that have to buy things that are in the ASX 200 or the ASX 300. So don't let it dissuade you from actually buying shares, uh, but just be mindful that You've got to keep a close eye on it because, they, as you say, they are thinly traded, and any any major major uh, selling or buying is going to move swing the price around a lot. Thanks for taking my call. My question tonight is about Orison Group. The code is O R L. Um, I've got a, a reasonable percentage of my portfolio invested in this company because I really like it. It's got a very high return on equity, about 73%, I think, and the management um, I really really like. I'm just wondering, is uh, can Sally McDonald and her team continue these high rates of return on equity? Uh, is the performance of this business going to continue to be good? And uh, what's the uh, valuation for the company in the next few years? Sally is a, um, uh, a, a retailing legend in this country, you know, and I, I don't have to mince words. And I'm not saying that because we're friends. Um, and I'm not saying that because we went to university together. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, Sally really is a, 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 a future retailing giant in this country if she wants to be. Um, and uh, as long as she's at this company, I think she'll deliver the goods. Mm. Um, this, is a, this has been a great business since she joined it. Uh, it's really interesting to note that from 2000 to 2005, which is the five years before mm. Sally joined, intrinsic value went sideways, share price went sideways, return on equity was probably 22 23% sometimes 27%. Sally joins, um, intrinsic value's gone from uh, about $1.71 uh, now to about $9.14, uh, and that's happened in, in the second five years, and that's when Sally's been there. Uh, and uh, return on equity has jumped, so it's now averaging about 50%, and in fact, recently it was, it was 80. Now, I think they were due to report today. I didn't see the result, but maybe you can tell me if they did, Greg. Oh, sorry, oh, we, there was Dan, anyway. Oh, Dan, yeah, Dan from Dan? Geraldton. I think they report tomorrow. Oh, they oh, report tomorrow, do they? Okay, we'll right. keep an eye on the report and have a look. Mm. So okay. Yeah. Okay. It's Greg. Greg from Perth. Hello there, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, just a message for Roger. I received your um, book in the post signed. Thanks for that. That's a pleasure. Uh, um, I advertised uh, that it was signed. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone will want one. Um, I just want your valuation on Decmel, please, Roger, if you sure, can. Sure, no problem. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give Mark a chance to answer it as well, but um, uh, let's have a quick look, see if there's been any changes in the last couple of days. Um, current valuation, $2.28. Uh, so um, share price you can see there on the chart. Uh, it's trading around its intrinsic value now. Um, and uh, I've got intrinsic value rising to $2.62 next year. Uh, I met with um, uh, Dickie, who's the COO, and I also met with Justine, who's the CFO. And I've got to tell you, I didn't meet with Scott, um, who's the, the, the son of the founder. Uh, he flew back to Perth. But I've never met two people um, who are arguably not required to be enthusiastic about the business that they actually are involved in. I've never met two people so enthusiastic about their company and about what the company does and how well it's going. Um, their enthusiasm for the business was infectious. If that is across the, the workforce at that business, uh, that business is going to do very, very well uh, and it certainly looks like it.